Okay, we might kick off. So welcome to today's combined ARC Center of Excellence for enabling eco-efficient beneficiation of minerals signature lecture with the University of Melbourne Department of Chemical Engineering Department lecture. And I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which this uh, meeting in Melbourne is taking place, the land of the Wunjuri people of the Kulin Nation and other um, indigenous uh, peoples throughout Australia where the other uh, members of the center are located. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people today. So today we're lucky enough to have Professor Steve Arms from Sheffield in the UK visiting in Australia. He, uh, many of you uh, met him last week at the Australian Colloid and Interface Symposium and he's here today and to talk about the polymerization induced self-assembly, a powerful platform technology for producing bespoke polymer nanoparticles. Steve is a fellow of the Royal Society, completed his PhD in Bristol. Um, he's been um, professor at Sheffield now for 20 years, since 2004. He has uh, 725 papers and H equals to 128. So he's a bit like Frank. Their H equals to the total number of papers I have. <laughs> so, no, a, 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 a outstanding researcher. And um, we look forward to hearing um, his talk today. So with that, I'd like to invite Steve up to um, talk to us about polymer-induced self-assembly, platform technology for bespoke polymer particles. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, George, for that very kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today in Melbourne and to, to give this, this signature lecture. Um, I'm a synthetic polymer chemist. I, I work uh, very much uh, at the Polymer Chemistry Colloid Science Interface. So almost all of my career, I've been designing polymer particles. And about 14 years ago, my group uh, started a, a, a a journey, if you like, in, in polymerization induced self assembly or PISA. We published about 200 papers in this uh, area since then. And I hope today to convince you that it is indeed a, a powerful platform technology for designing uh, tailor made bespoke polymer particles. This is a picture of Sheffield on a, on a very good day in the UK, and we have very few of those. So it's a carefully chosen photograph. So without further ado, I'd like to explain what PISA is. And the easy way to think about PISA, perhaps, is to think about aqueous formulations. And that's what I'm going to focus on today, aqueous formulations. But PISA equally applies to, can be applied to other systems as well, uh, alcohol uh, or non-polar media. But if we consider aqueous formulations, um, so this blue chain here is a, is a water-soluble homopolymer in an aqueous solution, then, if we're being a little, a little more specific. It's got an active chain end here, and we're going to grow from this end. This We're going to polymerize this red monomer to make this red chain. So the red monomer is chosen so that the red chain is hydrophobic or becomes hydrophobic as it grows. So what we're making, in fact, is an amphiphilic polymeric surfactant. And at some critical chain length for the growing red block, it becomes hydrophobic and drives self-assembly via micellar nucleation. The monomer can be either water miscible, in which case these are aqueous dispersion polymerizations, or the monomer can be water immiscible, in which case we're talking about raft emulsion polymerization. And I'll talk about both examples in this lecture. As the red chain gets long enough to become hydrophobic, these dye block chains pervade cones. And if you pack lots of cones together, you'll naturally get spheres. If the red chain grows a bit longer, then the, you get uh, truncated frustums, and those pack together to give worm-like particles, or perhaps hairy caterpillars might be a better description here. And if it grows a bit further still, if you've got a really quite um, uh, red block rich composition, then you can get vesicles, the block copolymer equivalent of uh, liposomes. So these are just cartoons, of course. What does reality look like? 
Well, uh, these are um, typical transmission electron micrographs of spheres, worm-like particles, which look like cooked spaghetti here, or uh, hollow particles, vesicles. And the important take-home message for PISA for, for you today is that it's very efficient in that the red monomer can be fully polymerized essentially within a couple of hours at 70 degrees in an aqueous formulation, maybe even quicker for an aqueous emulsion polymerization. It's very versatile in that it works for a wide range of uh, vinyl monomers, uh, methacrylics, acrylics, acrylamides, methacrylamides, vinyl acetate, styrene, etc. It's generic, as I've already mentioned, it works for various different types of media, not just aqueous, polar solvents such as lower alcohols, alkanes, supercritical fluids, etc. And it's scalable. So one of our industrial sponsors has taken a five gram formulation from our lab, gone all the way up to 100,000 gallons, and then not quite commercialized it, which is pretty, pretty frustrating. Um, so the chemistry we use to grow these block copolymer chains is, is something which is, I'm sure, familiar to most, if not all of you. It's RAF polymerization, an Australian invention. Uh, I reviewed the very first paper on RAF in macromolecules in 1998, and I remember writing then that, uh, you know, this, 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 there's a few little things the authors may want to fix on this paper, but it's a really, it's a really great piece of work and it will be highly cited, and, it, and indeed it was. I think that that original macromolecules paper has been cited over 4,000 times. So RAFT involves uh, an organosulfur um, RAFT agent, uh, typically a trithiocarbonate or a dithiobenzoate in our hands. And this, this reagent reacts rapidly and reversibly with the polymer radicals. And this buys you some, some control over the otherwise uncontrolled polymerization, such that the molecular weight e evolves uh, linearly with conversion and you get relatively narrow molecular weight distributions, the blue curve here, rather than the broad molecular weight distributions associated with conventional free radical polymerization. But the, one of the important things about raft chemistry is because it's radical based, it's very tolerant of functional functionality in the monomer and the solvent, and you can make well-defined di-block copolymers. So functional di-block copolymers, in fact, as I'll, and I'll give you various examples today. So our first, uh, first experiments in, in raft aqueous dispersion polymerization involved HPMA, this monomer here, hydroxypropyl methacrylate. So this monomer is water miscible up to about 10% at 70 degrees, but when polymerized, um, gives a water insoluble polymer. It precipitates from water. So what we do then instead is we grow it from one end of this black chain here, which is this polyglycerol monomethacrylate. So this is a water-soluble polymer with no LCST behavior. It's a, it's a very hydrophilic polymer. If we grow this uh, PHPMA red chain here, at some point it becomes sufficiently hydrophobic to, form, to, to nucleate and form sterically stabilized particles, or if you prefer block copolymer micelles. And in this, original expert, uh, in this original paper, we fixed the black block at a degree of polymerization of 65. And we dialed up the red block from around 30 to 300. And this enabled us, as we dialed up the red block, we dialed up the size of the, of the sterically stabilized nanoparticles. And this is a, a scanning electron microscope image of the largest particles. This is a one micron scale bar. These particles are around 100 nanometers in size. And the chemistry works pretty well. Um, you can get high blocking efficiencies, possibly higher, higher even than 90, 95%. You can get low dispersities, although you wouldn't know it from this original paper, we've demonstrated pretty low dispersities in, in later papers. Um, so it's a surfactant-free route to uh, spherical nanoparticles of, of tunable diameter, depending on the DP of the, of the red block. But if that's all you could do with, with uh, PISA, it wouldn't be very interesting. But as I've already indicated, what you can make is, is other morphologies, worm-like particles or vesicles. So how do you do that? How do you ensure that you uh, break out of a sphere-only sort of paradigm? So there's two parameters typically that you need to play with. One is the DP of the core-forming block, the X here, the PHPMA DP. The other parameter is the copolymer concentration. The concentration at which you choose to make these di-block copolymer chains, 10%, 15%, 25% solids, for example. 
So if we take these two parameters and plot them out on a phase diagram or a pseudo phase diagram, then pH PMA DP, this X parameter here on the Y axis, per polymer concentration on the X axis, what you can see here is we've got lots of uh, S stands for spheres, uh, W for worms, V for vesicles. What you can see in this pseudo phase diagram is we've got lots of space, base space for spheres, lots of phase space for vesicles. But if you want to hit the pure worm phase uh, reproducibly, then it's a really rather narrow phase space and it's pervaded by um, mixed phases. So if you want pure worms, you have to do typically quite a lot of uh, hard work to establish exactly what kind of composition and what kind of concentration range you need to be in to get that pure worm phase. So these pseudo phase diagrams act as a, as a very useful roadmap and they are the key for reproducible targeting of, of co pure copolymer morphologies, particularly worms. Um, I should also point out, I'm, I'm, I'm saying pseudo phase diagrams because on this side, we've got connectively trapped morphologies Whereas on this side, we've got, uh, if you like, thermodynamically preferred morphologies. So it's not a not a true phase diagram as a physicist would uh, would have it. Okay, so staying with this PGMA PHPMA system, what we discovered fairly early on um, is that the worms form very soft gels, freestanding gels, and these gels are thermoresponsive. So if you they, they, they form a gel at 21 degrees or higher, but if you cool down that gel, then you get degelation, and that's a thermoreversible process. And the reason you get degelation is that the worms fall apart to give something approximating to spheres. The reason this occurs, this morphological transition occurs, is because of uh, surface plasticization of this PHPMA block. So it's a thermoresponsive polymer, but not in the way that classical thermoresponsive polymers such as polynipam operate. Yeah, polynipam goes from water soluble to water insoluble backwards and forwards. Here, this block always remains water insoluble, but a subtle change in its partial degree of hydration is enough to change the morphology of the particles. We never go to the individual chains. So, one aspect about these gels is that they're very soft. The G prime is typically around uh, less than 100 pascals. Here it's about 80 pascals at 25 degrees. If you cool down this gel, it degels and you lose uh, the G prime. You go down to the viscosity of water, essentially, as indicated here. And on rewarming, you get back the original gel properties. There's some hysteresis here, but you essentially it's a, it's a reversible thermal transition. And the very softness of these gels, coupled with their hydroxy functionality, means that they have potential bio biomedical applications. So we collaborated with some stem cell biologists at Sheffield, Harry Moore and Irene Canton. And what these guys did was they put uh, <coughs> embryonic stem cells in the form of stem cell colonies into our gels. And they found that these stem cells didn't die but they didn't grow either. They fell asleep. They entered stasis, a dormant state. And that's primarily because of a, uh, the hydroxy functionality of the worm gels rather than their softness. Um, and that's interesting because it means if stem cells fall asleep for up to two weeks at 37 degrees, that's an opportunity to, to ship them anywhere in the world from manufacturing site to clinic or hospital. And then you can easily isolate these stem cells by uh, cold centrifugation under conditions where you've degelled. So uh, in principle, this is a cheap, dumb storage medium for embryonic stem cells. Uh, this is a, so what, what, I've, what I'm talking about on this slide, of course, is, is a worm to sphere, a, a, a thermoreversible worm to sphere transition. Can we do better than that? Can we access the third morphology, vesicles? Well, we published five years ago um, this, 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 this paper, this study, where we demonstrate that a single, di a single amphiphilic diblock copolymer can indeed form spheres, worms, or vesicles in aqueous solution simply by varying the temperature alone. So in this case, we swap out the PGMA, the polyglycerol monomethacrylate, for this uh, water-soluble block. This is poly-2-hydroxypropyl uh, methacrylamide. And we use this precursor to polymerize HPMA. So the interesting thing about this amphiphilic dye block 
is that there's a very, very subtle chemical difference between the, the, between the water soluble block and the water insoluble block. Now, the, the difference between NH and O is only one atomic mass unit. So this particular dye block copolymer is really very well suited to theoretical studies. So this is mean field theory um, as, as uh, carried out by Remco Tunier, our, our Dutch collaborator. I'm not going to talk about his theoretical results here. I'm going to, just to focus on our experimental results. But for this particular dye block with this composition, 41,180 in terms of the two DPs, this dye block does indeed form spheres at, at four degrees, worms at 22 degrees, and vesicles at 50 degrees. So it does exactly what we want. It's a, it's a, sh a so-called shape-shifting thermoresponsive dye block. And it does that because of this subtle uh, change in the partial degree of hydration of the PHPMA block. Now, if you talk to my collaborators at Sheffield, they will say, oh, well, TEM's all very well, but images are cheap. What you really need is to do the scattering experiments. But they work out pretty well as well. This is, these are three small angle X-ray scattering patterns. This is I of Q versus Q here. This is the scatter, where Q is the scattering vector. And the, I don't know very much about SACS, right? But in the low Q region, the gradient of these curves is diagnostic of the morphology. So if it's flat, if it's zero gradient, that's telling you you've got spheres. If it's a gradient of minus one, it's telling you you've got worms or rods, in this case, worms. And if it's a gradient of minus two, you've got vesicles. And that's exactly what we've got at these different temperatures. So the SACS is averaged over tens of millions of particles rather than a few dozen or a few hundred. And so it's much more statistically robust as a proof of structure. This all looks very good. But this is very much a prototype system. And the reason for that is, is, is indicated in this experiment. So we're doing rheology here. We're looking at solution viscosity versus temperature. We're starting with hot vesicles, as it were, at 50 degrees. We cool down those vesicles. We, the, the viscosity goes through a very pronounced maximum because we're forming worms here and they're trying to gel. And then after passing through that maximum at lower temperatures, we get the much less viscous free flowing spheres. So that all looks great. This matches the SACS and TEM results. But then you look at the speed or the, or the rate at which this experiment was carried out. The postdoc had to be extremely patient to do this experiment, half a degree an hour. This is, this is a 100 hour experiment. And the, the reason for that is that the PHPMA block is rather slow to respond to the temperature changes. Um, so this is too slow really to be uh, potentially useful. Now, we've got much better results now, which I'm not going to talk about today, but we achieve it by swapping out the PHPMA block for its isomeric brother, 4-hydroxybutyl acrylate. Acrylates have lower TGs than methacrylates, uh, and the, the, the TG is a proxy for chain mobility. So by switching to P, PHBA as opposed to PHPMA, then we can get much faster response times on the order of seconds or minutes for these kinds of transitions. So those papers were published in Chemical Science in 2020 and 2021, Chemistry of Materials in 21, etc. Okay, so I've, I've, I've put this slide in because I know there's interest in the, in the Sustainable Mining Initiative on, on flocculation. And this is something we did about eight years ago now, trying to design uh, flocculating uh, new flocculants, new agents, for, for the flocculation of inorganic microparticles. So this work was, came out of a project sponsored by Procter & Gamble. And this company makes fragrance-loaded microcapsules for products such as Lenore, which is a, in the UK, it's a fabric conditioner. I'm not sure what the brand name might be in, in Australia. But um, basically the problem with these fragrance microcapsules, which are meant to get caught in your clothes, which act as a kind of a, a net, as it were, or mesh, the problem is that the fragrance microcapsules are rather uh, broad in their size distribution. They vary from about one to 30 microns. And the bigger particles, 20 to 30 microns, they get caught in the clothes easily. But the smaller particles pass through, they're not caught, so they're wasted. So our, our, uh, our brief was to try to design a flocculant to flocculate those fines to bring them up to the size of the, pri of the larger particles. So they'd all, all of the microcapsules would get caught on the clothes. So, so in that sense, the, the problem is very similar to the uh, flocculation of fines in mining. 
So what did we do to, to improve this, this deposition efficiency? So what we did was we designed some cationic block copolymer worms. I'm not going to describe how they were made. You can, you can look in this paper if you're interested. But we, we made cationic block copolymer worms, and we also cross-linked the cores of these worms. So this is just a TEM of the worms. And then we took silica as a model for the uh, fragrance microcapsules. So we did these experiments with one micron silica, four micron silica, and eight micron silica. Here, I'm showing you a, 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 an SEM of the um, four micron silica particles. And when you add a cationic block copolymer worms at rather low concentration to these particles, you can see that the worms coat the particles, but they also um, bridge between the particles. So this is a visual uh, confirmation of bridging flocculation, which you can't see with individual block copolymer, sorry, with individual copolymer chains. So this is quite a nice result. And of course, we did the laser diffraction on the original particles, which is the dotted, well, this dashed line here at four microns. And then indeed, these are aggregated to give 33 micron aggregates. Uh, unfortunately for P&G, although this worked beautifully on the model system, for reasons we don't understand, it didn't work when we applied the cationic block copolymer worms to the fragrance microcapsules. That's why they allowed us to publish it. <laughs> Um, the other point I would make is that core cross-linking of these worms is absolutely essential. If you just use linear worms, the torsional, let's just go back a second, the torsional forces between these large particles will just rip these bridging worms to shreds if they're linear. They have to be cross-linked and um, therefore reinforced. Okay, this is a, a, a paper we published last year in, 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 in macromolecules. And this is another raft aqueous dispersion polymerization formulation. But again, now we're looking at a specific application. We're trying to make these particles in highly salty media. And so what we're doing here is we're deliberately selecting uh, a polymer, which we know is very salt tolerant. So this is a phosphoryl-choline methacrylate. It's quite an expensive polymer, but we know it's soluble up to five molar sodium chloride. It's very salt tolerant. And then we polymerize from this uh, precursor using RAF chemistry, dimethylacrylamide. Now, polydimethylacrylamide is normally considered to be a water-soluble polymer. But if you polymerize it in the presence of two molar ammonium sulfate, it's actually insoluble. So under these conditions, you get particles rather than chains. So we've got blue, the blue chains are the PMPC salt tolerant block, and the PDMAT is for salted out chains. And what we're doing here is we're focusing on, uh, or we're targeting a really high degree of polymerization X. We're trying to get, we're trying to make high molecular weight water soluble polymers in low viscosity form, in particulate form. And um, so we can get up to a DP of around 6,000 here. And the chain extension, the, ch the, chain, the, the, the chain extension efficiency is quite high as judged by GPC. I'm not going to pretend these are well-controlled RAF polymerizations. They are not. The dispersities are two to three. What we argue in this paper and in a follow-up paper, which is about to appear in macromolecules on a different system, different high salt system, is that this uh, high dispersity is actually preferred to, to a well-controlled polymerization. And the reason for that is we're looking, we're looking to uh, achieve dilution triggered thickening, right? So these particles are turbid, they are free flowing, they're low viscosity. If you simply add water, fourfold dilution to go from two molar to half a molar, now the red chains which were salted out are now salted in. So the particles dissolve to give you a very thick, clear gel or, or <laughs> viscous liquid, depending on the DP. And so this is a dilution triggered thickening uh, response. Um, for which there may be uh, um, applications in the home and personal care market. And just to illustrate that a bit further, there's some viscosity versus shear rate data here. So we've got shear thinning uh, latex particles and, and um, relatively, uh, well, we've got, we've got a, a kind of a Bingham yield stress here for the um, thickened uh, solution. And for this kind of application, if you want high viscosity here in the final product, you want a high MW. 
not necessarily, well, you, the higher the MW, the better, because MW correlates with viscosity much better than MN. So actually having a high, dis high dispersity here gives you more thickening. If this was a 1.1 uh, dispersity, this would be less viscous. The other thing to note here is that because we're targeting such high DPs, the amount of raft agent that we're using here is really rather low at 63 ppm. And that means it's it's a relatively cheap formulation. There's, there's no visible color from the raft agent and there's very little smell. So we're moving in the right way, in the right direction to mitigate the traditional problems of using RAF chemistry. Okay, so I want to switch tack now from aqueous dispersion polymerization to aqueous emulsion polymerization for a few slides. So uh, people like Brian Hawkett uh, and, and French workers here, Frank D'Agosto, Muriel Lancelot, um, Jutta Riga, uh, and, and various uh, Australian, other Australian scientists other than Brian, have put a lot of time and effort into developing raft aqueous emulsion polymerization. So this involves water immiscible monomers such as styrene, benzyl methacrylate, methyl methacrylate, butyl acrylate, et cetera. Um, but you, and you, you can also get spheres, worms, and V-scores with this formulation. I'm going to focus here on very small spherical particles. In our formulation, we use not these monomers, but T-FEMA, this um, semi-fluorinated methacrylate. Uh, we originally chose this because it's a, re a very dense monomer and polymer. We wanted to look at high density particles. And this work was carried out by a master's student, Bernice Akpinar. Uh, Bernice was a, a brilliant student, but she decided not to stay on with us. She went to Imperial College uh, to do a PhD. So she was the one that got away. But um, in, this, in this paper from her master's thesis, um, she was a, very ably supervised by Lee Fielding, who's now an associate professor at the University of Manchester. She made a whole series of sterically stabilized PT FEMA core particles with PGMA, this dihydroxy uh, non-ionic water-soluble block as the steric stabilizer. And the, oh, and this is a typical image of the very small particles you can make with this chemistry. So these are of the order of 26 nanometers diameter. So you can get very high conversions um, narrow like uh, narrow size distributions and you can tune the particle diameter over a wide range but today I'm going to focus on the really small particles you can make with this formulation so um, in a follow-up piece of work um, Kate Thompson another postdoc in my group took these particles which I'm going to show uh, in cartoon form as green spheres with a, a, a blue shell here so he's, this has for composition PGMA 48 PT FEMA 50 these very small particles, if you homogenize um, oil in the presence of this aqueous dispersion using an ultra thorax, then you can make you can use these as pickering emulsifiers to get relatively large droplets, 20 to 30 microns. And if you fluorescently label the nanoparticles with a fluorescein um, co-monomer, then um, you can see them adsorbed around these droplets. Now, just making pickering emulsions of this size is not that interesting. But what we what we did with this macro emulsion is that we then further processed it using high pressure microfluidization. So what we do in these experiments is we deliberately make the macro emulsion using a, a large excess of nanoparticles. So there's lots of these nanoparticles, and this is not to scale. There's a lot more nanoparticles here than droplets. Um, and, and so when we further process this macro emulsion using the microfluidizer, under these conditions, we chop up these uh, large droplets and we reduce their size by two orders of magnitude. So we go from 20 to 30 microns down to around 200 nanometers. And that's why we need all this excess nanoparticles because they've got to coat the higher surface area now that we've generated via microfluidization. And now if we get the conditions right, we have essentially no excess nanoparticles. And this is a, a TEM image of the uh, nanoparticle superstructure that's left behind after the oil and the water phase has evaporated. So this is a, a kind of proof of structure. So the point here is that PISA is a convenient route to make sufficiently small, sterically stabilized nanoparticles that enable us to make uh, pickering nano emulsions. If you want droplets of 200 to 300 nanometers, you really need nanoparticles down at that 20 to 30 nanometers, about an order of magnitude lower than the droplet diameter. 
And we've done a lot more in this area since. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but a series of land reward papers here. We've done um, oil in water, as shown here, but we've done water in oil emulsions using hydrophobic particles. We've done um, non-aqueous pickering emulsions, uh, glycerol droplets in mineral oil, for example. But I'll, I'll leave those for another day. <clears throat> So something else we've done with raft aqueous emulsion polymerization, uh, using it to target very small particles, is a project which was part sponsored by Syngenta. It's a $16 billion a year agrochemical company uh, based in the UK and Switzerland and owned by a Chinese uh, company. So again, we use polyglycerol monomethacrylate as the stabilizer block. In this case, we use methyl methacrylate, the cheapest methacrylic monomer available, and we make sterically stabilized spheres. Uh, and again, that's not, not a big deal. Um, very, very straightforward synthesis. But and, and this is a TEM image of those spheres showing a very nice control over the size distribution. We then use these spheres as a particulate dispersant for agrochemical actives. So the agrochemical agrochemical uh, in question here is azoxystrobin, which is a, 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 a broad spectrum uh, fungicide. And azoxystrobin is a, is a water-insoluble organic molecule, which typically comes as uh, 100 to 200 micron crystals. So what you do is you take these large crystals, add our aqueous dispersion of nanoparticles, and you grind them. You do, you do wet ball milling um, for not very much, a few tens of minutes, perhaps, and you grind these crystals down to just two microns. And you hope that our nanoparticles adsorb onto this new fresh surface area and coat and stabilize these microparticles. So that's the principle. Does it work? Well, you can see our particles coating these rather ugly looking azoxystrobin crystals in a very nice uh, high coverage layer. And this not only works with azoxystrobin, but it works for a range of other fungicides as well. And, and also uh, other agrochemical actives. So you can, uh, seeing is believing, you can see our nanoparticles here. It also works for this pesticide as opposed to the fungicides. And potentially this has uh, some advantages over the other alternative processing methods for these kinds of chemicals. Unfortunately, having demonstrated proof of concept, Syngenta then decided that uh, they took against our particles. They decided they, they would be likely to be classified as nanoplastics and the therefore were unacceptable in, in future uh, formulations. Okay, so everything I've talked about so far involves taking a hydrophilic precursor block, a water-soluble block, and then growing the water-insoluble block from that precursor in water. And one question we asked ourselves a couple of years ago is, is it possible to reverse that sequence? It's, in other words, can we make the hydrophobic block first in water? Now that sounds very, very unlikely at first sight, right? You just think, well, you're gonna get a precipitate. What can you do with that? But actually you can make this work. So what you do is you, 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 choose, you design a, a, an ionic raft agent. Here it's a cationic raft agent, but it could be an anionic raft agent. So we've got a trithiocarbonate here, which is the raft part of the, or the, the, the yeah, the, the raft part of the molecule. And then we've got the um, uh, a morpholine group here, which gets protonated very easily at low pH. So that gives you the cationic character. So if you use this raft agent to polymerize uh, our old friend HPMA, hydroxypropyl methacrylate, you don't get a precipitate. Instead, you get charge stabilized particles. So this is the HPMA. You polymerize with this raft agent, you get charge stabilized particles. They're big, they're relatively ugly in terms of their size distribution, around about 700 nanometers in size. And then you use these latex particles as a precursor and you add a hydrophilic monomer, OEGMA in this case. The monomer diffuses into these particles and the locus of the polymerization of that second block is exclusively within the particles. And remarkably, these large latex particles rearrange to go from charge stabilized 700 nanometer particles to 33 nanometer sterically stabilized particles. Uh, it doesn't work with all, all monomers, but we got it to work with several. Um, and I should also point out that 
in the original latex particles, the trithiocarbonate group being hydrophobic is inside the particle. But after the polymerization, the second stage polymerization, these, these Z groups end up on the end of the stoic stabilizer chains. So that means they're, they're, they're there on the outside of the particle. Maybe they can re be removed more easily now. Uh, and perhaps also they can be used to you know, introduce thiol groups or something like that. So the important thing is that the polymerization occurs within the particles. And, and you know, if you take other monomers and try and polymerize them, polymerize them and they don't go into the particle, you just get uncontrolled radical polymerization in the aqueous phase and no dibloc. This is just TEM images to illustrate this cartoon. These are, this is a two micron scale bar. You can see these are around 700 nanometers. After the polymerization, you go down, this is 50 nanometers now, these are around 33 nanometers and, and much less scattering. This, this is a milky dispersion. So we get this remarkable reduction in particle diameter during this um, process. And you know we were very happy with this because we thought it was kind of counterintuitive and a bit new and interesting. I think two of the reviewers agreed with us, and there was there's always a third reviewer, right? And one of them was like, "Yeah, meh, who cares? What can you do with this? You can only do it with a few monomers. It's, this is not Angavanta." But anyway, we won. So um, on the next slide, I'll tell you what you can do with reverse sequence PISA, right? What you can do is use it to make hydro hydrolytically degradable nanoparticles. And that's what everybody wants nowadays, right? I'm finding it increasingly hard to get money for all vinyl polymers. So Matt Farmer is a current PhD student in my group, uh, published this very nice paper at uh, uh, end of last year. So what he did was he took uh, polycaprolactone, dihydroxy functional, uh, used a carboxylic acid functional raft agent to make a bifunctional raft agent by via esterification. And then he took this polycaprolactone hydrophobic precursor and he dissolved it in monomer, dimethylacrylamide in this case. And so what you do is you start as a bulk polymerization. Now this is not very viscous because this, this is a very short block here. It's only a DP16 overall. You start, you start the polymerization in the bulk and then at some intermediate low conversion, typically as well, possibly as low as uh, 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 20%, so you've just grown very short DMAT chains off each side, then you add water. And when you add water, you go from a soluble chain to a self-assembled nanoparticle. And then the polymerization continues from these particles growing out from the blue chains. And this works surprisingly well, right? You get high blocking efficiencies, you get low dispersities, um, and you can get nice, well-defined spherical nanoparticles with hydrolytically degradable cores, the red core here. This is what they look like by TEM, uh, very small, very uniform. Dynamic light scattering gives you a similar kind of result. Zeta potential versus pH says they're relatively non-ionic, uh, non as you'd expect for this kind of um, uh, steric stabilizer block. Um, and these particles are degradable. I'm not gonna show you the degradation data here, but they do degrade at, in acidic pH or low or, or um, basic pH, as you'd expect. They even degrade slowly at pH 7.4 37 degrees. But the important thing is that these particles are made in water where they're not degrading because it's a relatively fast polymerization, uh, even though it's at 80 degrees. But the important thing is their shelf life is pretty good, right? If you make these particles in water and store them at 20 degrees at, at around neutral pH, what we've got here is a GPC, two GPC traces, one for the fresh material, the, 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 the black trace, and it overlays perfectly more or less with the, with the green trace, which is recorded three months later. So you can make these degradable particles in water. They do degrade in acid base or, or a higher temperature, but they've got a pretty decent shelf life if stored in water at 20 degrees. So they might be interesting, but possibly as, pick, as degradable pickering emulsifiers. One, one uh, drawback of this, um, this synthesis though, is that you have to add quite a lot of DMAC cosol, a lot of the monomer here. And that means that we are restricted to spheres. We cannot access worms or vesicles. To do that, you need much shorter DMAC blocks, and that wouldn't be enough to dissolve the polycaprolactone precursor. 
So that's a restriction. Can we break? Can we break that paradigm? Can we can we lift that restriction? Well, we saw we've been following in the literature over the last uh, fifteen years or so some very nice work by various groups in the area of crystallization driven self assembly or CDSA. So the uh, the first paper in this area was from a Canadian group led by Ian Manners and Mitch Winnick. Xiao Song Wang was a former postdoc in my group actually. He was the first author on this science paper. And what they did was they showed that if you have a, a, a dye block copolymer where one of the blocks is crystalline, then if you at low, very low concentration, very high dilution, you can process this dye block uh, and, and, and en enable it to form rods. So you can get some very nice rod-like particles here. I don't want to go into the details of this, so you, you can read it for yourself, but Ian Manners has very much um, pioneered this work and uh, He's published a whole string of high profile papers in this area. And sadly, just before Christmas, uh, Ian uh, passed away. And he's been, he's, he's a big loss to, to, to science. And I don't know what he would have uh, discovered if he'd, if he'd have lived another five or 10 years. But anyway, um, other groups have done similar work. So Rachel O'Reilly and, and Andrew Dove's group in um, Birmingham, They've, they've done similar work as other people have with other crystalline polymers. So in this case, we've got polylactide, polyallactide, crystalline block, degradable block, polydimethylacrylamide, again made by, by RAF chemistry. And what, what this group showed that is you could make rod-like particles just like here, but also you could get platelets. And what you got depended on the uh, degree of polymerization of the polydimethylacrylamide. So again, this was CDSA was conducted in very dilute solution. And in this case, it's organic solvents. There has been some work doing it in aqueous solution, but again, it's, it's dilute. But here are some diamond platelets, here are some rods, and here are some mixed phases. What, what struck us about this chemistry is the design rules differ, right? For CDSA, Having a longer water-soluble steric stabilizer block gets you into higher water morphologies. And so that, that, may, that got us thinking that maybe this is something we could adapt for reverse sequence PISA. So this is what, we, this is what Matt Farmer's done. We've just uh, submitted this paper. Um, we're waiting on reviews. So he, he took lactide monomer, L-lactide monomer, polymerized it with this hydroxy functional raft agent, made a polylactide capped or a raft capped polylactide precursor, dissolved it in, uh, in uh, dimethylacrylamide monomer, then added water and self assembled, forming the dye block at intermediate conversion, added water, and then got either rods or platelets or a mixture of rods and platelets, depending on the degree of polymerization X. I'll show you some TMs in a moment, but let's just look at the, some of the data from this, from this in situ polymerization. So interestingly, if you look at the conversion versus time curve here, you wouldn't know that we've diluted the system dramatically at this point. The, the, the polymerization just keeps going at a pretty steady rate. But that was surprising for us, but in retrospect, it's easily explained. So you've got a certain rate for the bulk polymerization. It turns out that dimethylacrylamide actually polymerizes faster in water than in the bulk, even though the monomer concentration is a lot lower. Uh, so you don't really see it sort of it's, it's a self-compensating system. You don't really see a change in rate, a reduction in rate on water addition, which is helpful. If you look at if you uh, sample the reaction and, and, and run the GPC on these aliquots, then the molecular weight increases linearly. The uh, dispersity does creep up um, at the end, but we're interested in particles, not chains here. Uh, and being able to make non-spherical degradable particles could be interesting for Pickering emulsion, emulsion work. Uh, this is the GPC data plotted out as, as, as the raw curves. And just, this just illustrates the very nice blocking efficiencies that you get. This is the precursor. This is the final polymer. Final dispersion is 1.31. And, and Matt was very, very happy with these results, as was I. Whether the uh, reviewers will be is another matter. So um, this is just some illustrative TEMs. I think we can do better on the, these morphologies uh, in the future, and that's what we'll be working on. But here are some rods, and here are some platelets. I think we should be able to make better platelets in the future. And that these intermediate 
dps so x is 70 here x is 300 here and the intermediate dps we have intermediate mixed phases clearly are they degradable well we've done G preliminary gpc studies which are ongoing uh, 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 in um, in mildly alkaline solution we can start to see changes within a few weeks it's similar in acid solution and also at seven, at pH 7.4. But again, I want to emphasize that, uh, so, so this is the tip, this is kind of what you'd expect. Alkaline hydrolysis is faster than acidic, it's faster than neutral, straight from organic chemistry. Uh, but I want to emphasize that these same particles after storage for four weeks at 20 degrees, there's much less, I can't say in this case there's no change, but there's much less of a change in the molecular weight distribution. So again, there's, there's some evidence that we might be able to have some kind of useful storage life for these kinds of particles. So in conclusion then, I hope I've convinced you that PISA is a, is a versatile platform technology for the rational design of a wide range of polymer particles. Worm gels offer some uh, potential applications for the, for the storage of embryonic stem cells. Cationic worms are super flocculants for uh, 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 large inorganic microparticles. There's a shape-shifting thermoresponsive dye block copolymer, or a series of them really, but exhibit unique self-assembly behavior in aqueous solutions. So no other block copolymer or surfactant can do this at fixed composition, fixed concentration. Uh, sterically stabilized spherical nanoparticles can be used to make nano emulsions. Uh, they can also be used to make to stabilize uh, aqueous suspensions of agrochemicals such as those oxystrobin. You can make hydrolytically degradable nanoparticles by reverse sequence PISA. That's where its real power lies. Uh, and the marriage of reverse sequence PISA with CDSA enables us to get out of the, the sphere paradigm into diamond platelets or rods. Um, it's been a privilege to work with a very talented group of PhDs and postdocs. Uh, and a couple of very valuable collaborators in SACS and mean field theory. There's been a lot of bills to pay and these organizations have paid the bills. I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I also have a couple of postdocs available if people are interested. This is in a very wacky area though. Thank you very much. So let's take first a couple of questions in the room and then I'll go online, take questions. Anybody, Paul? Just at the beginning, I was questioning the stability of your data particles uh, and whether you considered poor cross-linking, post-functionalization cross-linking, but then looking at the later slides and showing the stability, is it, is it necessary or they? We can call cross-link. Uh, and we've done that by various chemistries. So the one thing we can't do is to add a, a bifunctional monomer during the polymerization of a second block or the synthesis of a second block. That doesn't work. What we Instead, what we do is we add the, the dimethacolate or diacolate as a third block. And that just ties all those ends, to, those hydrophobic ends together. That works beautifully, right? So, so for, for reasons I don't understand, statistical copolymerization doesn't work. We tend to get precipitate, et cetera. But the, the, the third block approach works really well. Other ways of cross-linking uh, involve um, latent cross-linking. So what you can do is statistically copolymerize something like glycodimethacolate and then do chemistry of the epoxy groups to, to lock those chains together. And that can involve um, using a diamine it can involve using uh, three amino propyl siloxane or, or thiol uh, propyl siloxane, the macapto. So there's lots of ways of doing it. And for some applications, we need to do it. So for the high pressure microfluidization, some particles fall apart under the 30,000 PSI. But if we core crossing them, they're robust. For the superflocculants, they only work if they're core crossing those worms. So, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, Frank? Frank? Great, great work with beautiful structures. Um, just have a thought, trying to understand, can you actually use that from an interface? And if you can, how would it be different for somebody like Rafi, yeah, right, Rafi, the problem? Yeah, so it's a good question. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I guess if there's no in, intrinsic reason why you couldn't. I guess I'm not sure if you get. But I'm just thinking if you could make um, yeah make a spot layers yeah yeah uh, certain density functionality. So if you had a surfactant, a surfactant like raft agent which went to that interface and then polymerized from that, that would probably work. I guess um, if it did work, I'd be inclined to see what happened from the nano emulsion droplets, if you yeah. like, where you'd have um, high surface area, high uh, ma higher mass transport, which might help. Depends what you what you would like to do with it afterwards, but we can maybe discuss that over lunch. Okay, are there any questions uh, from the people online? You can either just unmute yourself or type something into chat. Steve? Oh, yes, Kevin. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. I, I was just looking at the um, steric stabilization um, of the Pickering emulsions. Have, have you been able to extend that into this? Um, uh, so-called area of nanobubbles, um, where you stabilize tiny bubbles that might act as points of nucleation for growing gas bubbles. Anything? We, we, we have, so these are, these are air bubbles in water, right? Yeah. So you, because you, you you're getting a tight structure for, around um, some of those, some what they might be oil particles or something. Yeah. So, so we've done some work on designing particles for foam stabilization, but but those have not those are older studies. They don't involve PISA. But the I mean the um, the air water interface is is typically characterized as being anionic and hydrophobic, and so what we've done in the past is designed cationic particles which would stick uh, to such surfaces. Uh, I could imagine. Oh, could, so, so cationic particles like that would be terrible emulsifiers for oil, but for nano bubbles, maybe. I guess how would you generate them by ultrasound? I'm not sure. Um, I know um, uh, Sebastian is online. Could probably comment on how he's generating them. So, so what, one thing I should say is we're we're, des we're currently designing some. Um, cationic nanoparticles to be um, antimicrobial nanoparticles. And in that case, we find they're only antimicrobial when we introduce some hydrophobic character as well. And those cationic mixed hydrophobic nanoparticles do stabilize foams quite nicely after handshaking. So I think those would be prime candidates for stabilization of nanobubbles. Thank you. Uh, Anthony? What's the usual stage of the scale? I think you have something you've got up to 100,000 gallons. Yeah, that's, that was from a non aqueous formulation. Um, I, mean, I, I think the real issue is that uh, the applications I've described today have, have, have been you know, enticing from our point of view, but not sufficiently enticing from the industrial partner's point of view to justify the cost. Uh, there's always been some reason why uh, the answer has been no. So for the for the uh, for the scale for the hundred thousand gallon scaler, um, basically it involved a, a nanoparticle lubricant for the internal combustion engine. So the beauty of the beautiful thing about that is uh, uh, it's a closed system. There's already some sulfur there. Nobody cares about raft chemistry. It does the job. And it did do the job. I mean, these, these nanoparticle lubricants we made, uh, which were core cross-linked, actually, um, they they led they could be made in, in uh, at scale in concentrated media. They delivered uh, lower CO2 emissions, higher miles per gallon, and um, they they reduced uh, long-term wear within engine or uh, within engines. Okay, and and I know that because the company involved did extensive road trials. I mean, we're talking about 100,000 miles per vehicle. So they did it really seriously. Uh, and the problem is they've not been able to commercialize it. They've not been able to hook up with a car manufacturer because all the car manufacturers are putting their money into electric cars, right? It's the right technology at the wrong time. If, we, if we'd done this 10 years earlier, I think there's, there's really no barrier to commercialization. 
The mechanical engineers who did that uh, scale up said it was the easiest scale up they'd ever done. It worked beautifully. So um, I'm not saying that's true for all piece of formulations, but for some, it's clearly clearly possible. Um, some of the yeah, there's some tricks, of course. Uh, companies that make particles in general at scale typically do it by by monomer staff, not a, sort of dripping the monomer over over a, a few hours, perhaps, and that enables them to control the exotherm. And that I think that works absolutely fine if you want spheres. I'm not sure if that's the best way to get worms or vesicles, but spheres are what they wanted in this application. Okay, just to go back for Paul's question. So um, uh, Kevin's colleague, Supashish, says that they currently generate the nanobubbles by acoustic and hydrodynamic cavitation. So okay. yeah, some kind of ultrasound. Yeah. So you know, that's on a relatively small scale, is it? In a laboratory. Yeah, yeah, yeah I don't yeah. think they're doing yeah. full scale. So in the future, maybe uh, in a year or two, well, within a year or so, maybe we can provide some particles to, yeah. to try that. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Paul, last Maybe yeah. last question. Okay, no, we've not we've not cons we've not considered that. That would be interesting. Um what of course does happen regardless of a of a of a thermochromic effect is a is a change in the in the uh, the physical appearance, right? So the, the very small spheres are almost transparent. The worms form a, a relatively transparent gel, uh, but the vesicles form a, a white, turbid, milky-looking dispersion. So you definitely you might have to take that into account if you were to try and introduce a thermochromic material. But if you've got any candidates for that, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. There's a, there's a fly here that really likes it. Yeah, there is a fly. I got to... it's, this is um, a lot of flies in the summer in Melbourne. This is not the worst year we've had, but anyway, it's not good. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Do you think is there an elimination of the human nitrogen polymer? Or, I mean, is it possible to humanize the polymer hydrophobic nitrogen for example, and you can use it to make the nitrophobic polymer? I don't think that would work. Um, you, you, mean, you mean to homo polymerize that to? To get a, a core of PDMS essentially. So I want to try and do something like that with with linear PDMS, not with the macromolecule. I don't think that I don't think the macromolecule is the way to go for two reasons. One, it's very hard to homopolymerize macromolecules. You probably need to statistically copolymerize it to get the polymerization to work, even at a deep, even at a molecular weight of a thousand, which is commercially available. Uh, the other problem is that that PDMS macromolecule wouldn't be miscible in water, right? It, you might be able to do something in an IPA water mixture, like a three a three to one. Yeah, so a three to one mixture of isopropyl alcohol and water that might work. So you'd, you'd have a sort of a, a mixed aqueous dispersion polymerization. That's that's possible, but you still might need a statistical copolymer there. Okay, thanks everyone uh, in Melbourne and everybody online. Um, let's thank Steve again.